back to jail. Former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has been sentenced to 10 years in jail in a case in which he was accused of leaking state secrets. Tonight, his followers cry foul and accuse the government on imprisoning its opponents prior to an election. Stand by to retaliate. US officials say that Joe Biden's response to the Jordan attack is likely to be powerful, but the US is wary on triggering another wider war with Iran. The future now. Elon Musk says Neuralink has implanted first brain chip in a human. Billionaire startup will study the functionality of interface which it says those with paralysis control device with their thoughts. Finally found? An explorer in the Pacific Ocean says he finally solved the mystery of the century. All that and more as World News Tonight starts right now. This is Alaverna World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here's Mahish Jani. A very good evening to all. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us uh, right here on Abdurrahman 24's World News Tonight. Well, we want to take you straight to Pakistan where former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan has been sentenced to jail. That story is breaking tonight. But well, Pakistan's former leader Imran Khan has been sentenced to 10 years in prison for leaking state secrets. The hearing took place today in a closed courtroom established under the Official Secrets Act in Rawalpindi's Adila Jail, where Khan and former Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi are already incarcerated on corruption convictions. Imran Khan's political party, Pakistan Theory Gain Saf, in a statement said that the pair have been sentenced 10 years each in a sham case with no access to media or public in cipher case, adding their legal team will challenge the decision in a higher court as they hope to get sentences suspended. The sentencing in the latest in a string of legal battles faced by Khan and comes ahead of a parliamentary election scheduled for February 8, a vote the outstood former leader is unable to contest due to his previous conviction. Tuesday's sentencing in what is popularly known as a cipher case comes after Khan was accused of leaking an encrypted diplomatic cable read by a Pakistan diplomat in March 2022 based on a meeting with a US department official. Khan had claimed the document proved that his ouster in a parliamentary no-confidence vote in 2022 was a conspiracy to remove him from power. The former Prime Minister repeatedly alleged that Pakistani officials conspired with the country's powerful military and the US to remove him from office. All parties denied Khan's accusation. The U.S. response to drone attacks in Jordan that killed and wounded U.S. service members on Sunday is likely to be more powerful than previous American retaliatory strikes in Iraq and Syria, though the Pentagon and White House are being careful not to telegraph the administration's plans. President Joe Biden is under increasing pressure to respond to a, in a way that stops these attacks for good. Earlier, militants have targeted U.S. Uh, military facilities in Iraq and Syria over 160 times since October of last year. And several Republican lawmakers have called for the U.S. to hit inside Iran directly to send a clear message. We will respond. The White House on Monday said U.S. President Joe Biden was weighing his options. After the drone attack in Jordan by Iran-backed militants that killed three U.S. service members and wounded dozens more. Here's White House National Security spokesperson John Kirby. We do not seek another war. We do not seek to escalate. But we will absolutely do what is required to protect ourselves, to continue that mission, and to respond appropriately to these attacks. Earlier in the day, U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin spoke on the issue as well. The President and I will not tolerate attack on U.S. forces, and we will take all necessary actions to defend the U.S. and our troops. Later, Pentagon spokesperson Sabrina Singh identified the soldiers killed in Sunday's attack, the youngest victim just 23 years old. The names of those soldiers who lost their lives were Sergeant William Rivers, Specialist Kennedy Sanders, and Specialist Breonna Moffitt. Right now, we assess that there are more than 40 that have been injured. Um, we do expect that number to continue to fluctuate as uh, our service members, as you know with TBI, report symptoms later on, so that number could continue to grow. The attack put new political pressure on Biden to deal a blow directly against Iran, a step he has been reluctant to take out of fear of igniting a broader war. Sunday's strike marks the first deadly attack against U.S. troops 
since the Israel-Hamas war erupted in October. The United States is trying to determine how the suicide drone managed to evade the base's defenses. U.S. troops have been attacked over 150 times in Iraq, Syria, and Jordan, as well as on warships in the Red Sea, where Houthi fighters in Yemen have been firing drones and missiles at them. Well, Vietnam and the Philippines have agreed to cooperate on maritime security in the South China Sea, a conduit for $3 trillion of annual shipborne trade that China claims almost in its entirety. The deal signed during a state visit to Hanoi by President Fernando Marcos Jr. today will see the two countries, Coast Guards, working together to prevent and manage incidents in the disputed waters. Vietnam and the Philippines agreed today to boost cooperation among their Coast Guards and to prevent untoward incidents in the South China Sea in an announcement during a state visit to Hanoi by the President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. Marcos received a welcoming ceremony before attending meetings with the Vietnam's President and Prime Minister separately. The two Southeast Asian countries have competing claims over some parts of the South China Sea, a conduit for 3 trillion of annual shipborne trade that China claims almost in its entirety. The two memoranda of understanding on security covered incident prevention in South China Sea and maritime cooperation among Coast Guards, according to a Vietnamese official who announced the deals during a formal ceremony in the country's presidential palace. The agreements in Hanoi, details of which were not disclosed, could risk angering Beijing, especially if they paved the way for future compromises on disputed claims. China tends to view progress in the resolution of the border disputes, among other claimants, with skepticism. Well, it's not only in Sri Lanka, but even in South Korea. The new online platform bill debated in the Korean parliament seems to have rattled international activist groups. Following President Yoon's calls for measures to prevent monopoly in the online platform market and promote a healthy competition, the country's antitrust regulator is uh, due to propose a bill to meet these goals. A bill to regulate market domination by online platforms has sparked debate among domestic and global businesses in the tech industry. The Online Platform Fairness Act is currently being drafted by South Korea's Fair Trade Commission, with the bill set to be announced sometime next month. The FTC aims to prohibit unfair business practices and ease consumer burdens by restricting market leaders from keeping competition in check. This in turn could provide more opportunities for small and medium-sized businesses and startups to enter the market. While the full details of the bill have yet to be revealed, the FTC has said that it would crack down on platforms that are engaging in monopolistic practices. Citing Google's policies preventing game publishers from releasing their titles outside of Google's Play Store. It also cited domestic tech giant Kakao's manipulation of its algorithm to favor its own cab drivers above others on its Kakao mobility apps. The regulator has said that it will define market leaders by setting a quantitative standard such as for sales and the number of users, similarly to how the EU qualifies a large online platform as a gatekeeper in its Digital Markets Act. But domestic startup firms were found to have concerns in a survey conducted by Startup Alliance Korea, with many saying that startups that are not profitable but have a large number of users face being regulated, which could hinder growth. In response to growing concerns from the tech industry, the government says it will limit the number of companies it defines as a market leader to four or five firms. These are most likely to be domestic tech companies Naver and Kakao, as well as global firms such as Google and Apple. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce voiced opposition to these proposed regulations, calling on Seoul to provide sufficient opportunity for dialogue with Washington and that the full text of the proposed legislation should be made publicly available. It's expected that it will take more than a year to implement the law even after the disclosure of the bill, considering the time it takes for the bill to pass through the National Assembly and subsequent subordinate laws to be enacted. Well, French farmers are going on strike. Why? That story and the details coming right after this break. You're watching World News Tonight. Welcome back everyone to World News Tonight. Now the members of the British royal family are now back in their respective homes after being treated for medical matters. However, the royal palace says that the functionality of the throne might be delayed for a few weeks. Following that story for us tonight is other Berners Clifford Pereira who is standing by in Yorkshire in the UK with the latest Clifford. 
Hi Mahesh, the King and the Princess of Wales have both returned home from the hospital after receiving medical treatment. Kingston Palace said that Catherine left hospital on yesterday morning and returned to her home in Easter almost two weeks after abdominal surgery. She was admitted to the London Clinic, the same private hospital where King Charles had treatment for an enlarged prostate. Hours later yesterday, Buckingham Palace announced that the King has also left the clinic after spending three nights receiving care. The king had corrective procedure for burning condition and it has been reported he could take off for a month off from public duties as he recuperates. Charles had spent time at his daughter-in-law's bedside before his own treatment. Mahesh. Absolutely. Uh, Clifford Pereira, the Derena World News Special Correspondent reporting from Yorkshire in the UK. Thank you. Well, French farmers have begun moving hundreds of tax tractors in an effort to blockade key routes into the French capital, termed the Siege of Paris. Now, farmers argue that they are being hit by uh, falling income and one environmental regulations, rising red tape and competition from imports. An extraordinary sight on the Paris highways. Tractors, hundreds of them, as far as the eye can see. Signs in French reading, angry farmer. Angry over what French farmers say is an existential threat to their way of life. Red tape, low prices and high taxes they say may put them out of business. We've had enough, this organic farmer says. Enough with demands disconnected from reality. Enough with the markets spiraling downwards. These protests have been rocking France for days. But now, farming unions say they're kicking into higher gear, vowing a siege on the French capital, attempting to block all major roads into Paris, threatening to drive their tractors all the way to Elysee, the presidential palace. In southern France, farmers setting a truck of red peppers on fire, then flipping it. Tires set aflame, trash dumped outside government offices. France is deploying some 15,000 police officers to keep farmers from literally shutting down Paris. The interior minister threatening arrests, putting farmers on notice, saying authorities won't tolerate a blockade on Paris airports or the Rungus Fresh Food Market, one of the world's largest, which feeds millions of people. The unrest is fueled by frustration over impacts from the war in Ukraine, which led the EU to suspend import limits for Ukrainian food. Now farmers say cheap Ukrainian goods are flooding France and driving down prices. Well, Nikki Haley was targeted by a second swatting attempt just two days after authorities responded to a similar call regarding Haley, as per reports by Reuters. Following that story for us tonight, we have other bitterness. Suzanne Shanali standing by in Toronto, Canada with the latest. Shanali. Yes, Mahesh, Charleston County Sheriff's deputy responded on the 1st of January to Haley's home after a person who identified themselves as Rose called 911 claiming that Haley's daughter was lying in a pool of blood and Haley was threatening to shoot herself. The caller claimed to be on the phone with Haley and uh, the deputy spoke to an unidentified woman at the front door who matched Haley's description and quickly concluded the call was a hoax. The January 1st swatting attempt had not been previously reported, but Haley alluded that the incident during NBC's Meet the Press program on last Sunday. Although Haley didn't provide a date for the incident or share details of what happened, but added that it had happened twice already. Mahish. Absolutely. Uh, Suzanne Shanali of the Renault World News Special Correspondent reporting from Toronto in Canada. Thank you for that. Well, BYD, the world's largest electric car maker, said it expects its earnings for 2023 to jump by as much as 86.5% buoyed by record deliveries. Its profitability, however, remains far behind rival Tesla because of the American giant's bigger profit margins. Chinese electric vehicle leader BYD expects net profit last year to have soared as much as 86.5%. It's been buoyed by strong sales and cost-cutting. The firm also credited a rapid rise in overseas sales and growing advantages from its sheer size. 
BYD overtook Tesla in the final quarter of last year to become the biggest maker of EVs. The company handed over more than half a million vehicles during the period. Now it says scale is helping it to control costs in the supply chain. In a filing to the Shenzhen Stock Exchange, BYD said all that would drive profits up to as much as $4.3 billion. If confirmed, the latest profit jump would see it far outpace Tesla, which posted a 19.4% growth in net profit. Dramatic as they are though, the figures would actually mark a slowdown for BYD. In 2022, its profits surged by a blistering 446%. Now the firm is pressing ahead with ambitious overseas growth plans that have rivals worried. Earlier this month, Tesla boss Elon Musk warned that Chinese car makers like BYD would demolish global rivals if trade barriers aren't erected. Now, the US-based United Airlines has reportedly initiated discussions with Airbus to acquire additional A321neo aircraft in a bid to uh, mitigate the anticipated disruptions due to potential delays in Boeing 737 MAX 10 deliveries. United CEO Scott Kirby has reportedly traveled to Toulouse in France to discuss the deal following the Alaska Airlines mid-air emergency. United Airlines has been one of the biggest victims of the turmoil at Boeing. Dozens of its 737 MAX 9 jets were grounded following the mid-air blowout of a large panel on one operated by Alaska Airlines. Now United also faces delays in getting new planes, after the incident raised doubts over regulatory approval for a new model of the MAX, for which it has placed big orders. The chaos has the airline considering its options. As sources say Chief Executive Scott Kirby flew to France for talks with Airbus. He's said to be sounding out the possibility of an order for its A321neo jets. Trouble is, they're in hot demand and all but sold out for years to come. However, Bloomberg News says Airbus is trying to buy back delivery slots from other airlines in a bid to construct a viable offer. United has 277 Boeing MAX 10 jets on order. That's a larger variant than the one in the blowout drama, but could still be affected by the troubles at Boeing. Kirby said last week that United hadn't cancelled the order, but he added that the US plane maker wouldn't be able to meet the contracted delivery dates on many of the aircraft. Signs of a possible Airbus deal have reportedly raised concern at Boeing, which shares historical roots with United. But Monday later brought hope of a silver lining. Irish budget airline Ryanair, one of Boeing's biggest customers, said it would take over any MAX 10 orders dropped by US carriers. A woman in Australia survives a shark attack. That story right after this break. Welcome back everyone to World News. Well, the future seems to be right here. Elon Musk said uh, that the first human patient had received a brain implant from his startup Neuralink Corp, a significant step forward for the company that aims to one day let humans control computers with their minds. Uh, in a post on X, Musk said that the patient is recovering well and that the initial results of the procedure were promising. Elon Musk says his Neuralink brain chip startup has put an implant in a human patient for the first time. Musk said Sunday that the patient is recovering well and that, quote, initial results show promising neuron spike detection. Spikes are activity by neurons, which use electrical and chemical signals to send information around the brain and to the body. It's been a bumpy road for Neuralink to reach this point. The company, valued at around $5 billion last June, has faced calls for closer scrutiny of its safety protocols. It was reported earlier this month that the company was fined for violating federal rules on the movement of hazardous materials. Last November, lawmakers requested an investigation into whether Musk had misled investors about the safety of its technology after veterinary records showed problems with implants on monkeys, including paralysis, seizures, and brain swelling. 
The U.S. Food and Drug Administration cleared the company to conduct its first human trial last year. Neuralink says the study uses a robot to surgically place a chip in a part of the brain that controls the intention to move, and that their initial goal is to enable people to control a computer cursor or keyboard with their thoughts alone. Musk said on X that Neuralink's first product would be called telepathy, and that, quote, initial users will be those who have lost the use of their limbs. Sort of like Musk has said its chips could one day be used to treat conditions like obesity, autism, depression, and schizophrenia. Neuralink did not immediately respond to a request for further details. Now, a 29-year-old Australian woman is recovering in hospital tonight after a near-death encounter with a bull shark in the Sydney Harbour. There are fresh warnings about the dangers of lurking, uh, lurking in Sydney waterways after this bull shark attack. Lauren O'Neill, surrounded by emergency responders, intensive care unit paramedics and police, overseeing her dash to St Vincent's Hospital in an ambulance. But it was her neighbours she left behind who really saved her life after her encounter with the bull shark. Lauren's social media posts reveal her passion for the water and the harbour. She lives on it at Elizabeth Bay and works for the Environment Minister. But yesterday, a swim at dusk outside her private pool so nearly proved fatal. Residents sounded the warning after realising the 29-year-old was in trouble. Witnesses rushed to the jetty, including Fiona Crago, who's a vet. She was severely mauled on her right leg and she was losing a lot of blood. I just focused on what I had to do, which was to stem the blood flow and bandage the leg. Throughout her ordeal, Lauren was conscious and thanking everyone for helping her and calling triple zero. An examination of her bite wounds confirmed a bull shark was responsible. As terrifying as this bull shark attack must have been, they are very rare. In 1963, a woman was fatally mauled in Middle Harbour. The next incident was in 2009, a Navy diver losing an arm and a leg in an encounter 850 metres from here in Woolloomooloo Bay. Well, the disappearance of Amelia Earhart's plane over the Pacific Ocean in 1937 is one of the world's enduring mysteries. Now, a pilot uh, and an explorer says that he believes he found the plane halfway between Hawaii and, and Australia. She was a pioneering pilot, the first person to fly solo from Hawaii to the mainland U.S., and also the subject of one of the world's greatest mysteries. I hope to accomplish something really scientifically worthwhile for aviation. Amelia Earhart disappeared trying to circumnavigate the globe in 1937. Earhart and her twin engine aircraft never to be found, unless this sonar image is the key to changing that. Well, you'd be hard pressed to convince me that's anything but an aircraft, for one, and uh, two, that it's not Amelia's aircraft. That's pilot and real estate investor Tony Romeo, who set out on a 100 day deep sea expedition last year near Howland Island, where Earhart was heading to refuel. Romeo's company, Deep Sea Vision, used multi million dollar sonar technology to capture this image 16,000 feet down, even deeper than the Titanic. There's no other known crashes in the area um, and certainly not of that era um, and that kind of design with the tail that you see clearly in the image. Underwater archaeologist Dr. Andrew Piotrowska isn't convinced yet. It's not the first time that somebody's come forward with, with some piece of evidence of, of possibly finding Amelia, but I would certainly want to put eyes on that target. Um, and take a closer look. And that's just what Romeo's team plans to do soon, with cameras and a remotely operated vehicle. So why can't a group of unknowns uh, go out and solve aviation's greatest mystery? There's something that inspires you, go do it. Just as the barrier-breaking flyer did herself. Well, for 87 years, there were so much of theories as to what happened to her plane. If they have actually found this plane uh, in the Pacific Ocean, that means, well, all those theories of she landing in one of the islands, well, they are not true. She went down in the, uh, into the ocean. Well, that is a part of your world tonight. Thank you very much for joining us. We'll be back again tomorrow at the same time with another edition of the World News. See you then. Bye for now.